All right. So let me kick off with a short introduction and then I will introduce you to the show. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good day to all our viewers across the globe and welcome to this exceptionally exclusive edition of Global Arena on my YouTube channel, Global Arena TV, recorded on Thursday, the 2nd of March, 2023. I'm your host, Umar Isa Dandugu. Well, I have, uh, I've got a spectacularly diverse panel of experts and communication specialists to talk us through something of journalistic concern that has generated a great deal of controversial debates. Well, I'm not talking about politics directly, not yet. I am simply talking about the issue of objectivity and impartiality in modern journalism. Is it still alive, dying, or already dead? We will, of course, figure it out in the course of the um, program. But indeed, a lot of people think that it's not just possible for journalists to detach their feelings from their work. For example, how do you expect a Palestinian journalist to report about the Israeli occupation of the West Bank and the killings of Palestinians by the Israeli forces? And how would you expect an Indian journalist to report about the Indian-Pakistani dispute? Also, how would you like an Iranian media like TV, Press TV to report about the Iran nuclear deal, the JCPOA. Well, this will continue to be a highly contentious and debatable issue, but let's get some basics, of course, uh, for starters. According to Wikipedia, journalistic objectivity is a considerable notion within the discussion of journalistic professionalism, and it may refer to fairness, disinterestedness, factuality, and non-partisanship but most often encompasses all these qualities. And one attention-grabbing piece from the very same Wikipedia that I got is saying, and I quote, objectivity in journalism aims to help the audience make up their own mind about a story, providing the facts alone, and then letting audiences interpret those facts on their own. So to maintain an objectivity in journalism, journalists should present the facts whether or not they like or agree with those facts. Objective reporting is meant to portray issues and events in a neutral and unbiased manner, regardless of the journalist's opinion or personal beliefs. So to many, this is simply impossible because, uh, but like one seemingly amazing thing is what the CNN's chief international correspondent, Christian Abampo once said, that is be truthful, not uh, neutral. She also said neutrality can mean you are an accomplice to all sorts of evil. So given all these things and the rest, can we say that being neutral means being hypocritical? Well, I don't know. I don't have all the answers, but my guests today will help talk us through these issues bit by bit. And to do that, I've got uh, Gina London. She uh, She's now currently living in Dublin, the Republic of Ireland. Uh, she was a former, she's a former CNN journalist who got a prestigious Emmy Award for her emotional coverage <laughs> of the 9-11 attack. Uh, yeah, and she's joining us from Dublin, like I said, uh, Gina London. Uh, then we've got Dr. Yvonne Ridley. Uh, she is currently in London, of course, but she, uh, she lives mostly in Scotland. She's a British journalist who was captured by the Taliban in 2001 when she... Um, entered Afghanistan illegally. Uh, she also accepted Islam two years later because of how the Taliban treated her, quote unquote, as she puts it in her book, In the Hands of Taliban, they treated her with courtesy and respect. And she thinks that the coverage of Taliban issues by Western media is not objective. And that's why I decided to bring her uh, on the panel in order to talk about this issue, among other things, and whether or not she still thinks that the way the Taliban is portrayed by the international and Western media organizations is still unbiased, is still biased and partial. Um, well, um, ladies, thank you very much, both of you, for honoring my invitation and for, for speaking on my channel, Global Arena. Thank you very much indeed. Thank, thank you. you. Well, without uh, wasting much of our time, uh, let's get started. Um, 
Well, let's start with the basics. What can you say about objectivity um, in the modern day journalism? Uh, can I start with Eugenia London? Okay. Hi, Umar. Thanks. Nice to be here. I, Maybe from my point of view, having worked as a journalist, I think there's an almost an un unattainable objective around the concept of pure objectivity. Human beings, as you illustrated with your Palestinian and other illustrations and the, the examples that you gave, we do make a series of subjective decisions when we're writing, even if we are trying to be fair, balanced, tell the truth within the context and the truth that's available at that time. And I think when objectivity in of itself is the only goal, you open yourself up as an organization, as the media, the tr trust of the media is, at, I think, an all-time low, according to the research I saw from the Columbia Review before I was coming on to this program. And a lot of that is because it's easy to aim targets if a legacy media organization makes the mistake as, see, they're not being objective. And so that's something I think the, the context of what objectivity is, especially in the history of journalism was one of muckraking and watchdog and advocacy journalism, many in the early 1900s, the United States, for example, the idea of portraying and investigating and exposing the oil monopolies of the Rockefellers, for example, are pretty exciting. If you do the research of Ida Tarbell and some of those famous muckraker journalists in the earlier days, and yet being a very politically aligned or having a real clear agenda and portraying your outlet, whichever outlet it is, as you are fair and balanced, that of course is misleading to the to the public and adds to that level of distrust. So I think for me, if there could be more transparency of points of view, there are some legacy opportunities to try to demonstrate as objectively as possible. There are times when opinion editorial, if it's labeled as such, can also be helpful in a, dis in a discussion and trying to maybe find if there is a balance around our expectations around legacy journalists to be objective and also what happens as a result, as you said, of potential advocacy journalists. Because on the point of being objective, for example, if there are 95 scientists that say there is climate change that's caused by humans and there's five that say there isn't, we don't give 50% of time to each of those because we want to be seen as objective. So there, I think there's more education that might be needed for the public. And that is a responsibility in many ways of the media as a whole. I hope that helps. Okay, yeah. So so Dr. Yvonne Ridley, is objectivity now uh, more of a myth this time around rather than a reality? How do you see it, your way? Well, I think that uh, the mainstream media does have a problem with objectivity. And Gina, of course, is quite, quite right when she says, you know, they will give 50% of equal time over one subject. But I think that it's very difficult for journalists to be impartial. We should always take the side of the oppressed. We should always give voice to the voiceless and to those who suffer from injustice. Now, in an earthquake, it's very easy, isn't it, to, to go into uh, such a catastrophic area and throw any impartiality out of the window. And, and quite right, too. Um, when covering a war, I think that uh, it's now been widely recognised that female reporters do add something more to their war reporting than male reporters who often get carried away um, with all of the kit and uh, military hardware 
and uh, go on about fighter jets and atomic power and and things which you know are really not um, that interesting. Mm. Uh, sort of boys with toys, but uh, a female war correspondent will take the viewer or the reader back to the ground and talk about the hardship and the humanitarian disaster and the woman who's struggling to keep her family safe and much more human interest stories. But uh, people who say, well, journalists should be impartial, I would say to them, how would you have covered reporting uh, what happened in Auschwitz? Would you give 50% of the documentary to the Jews who were horribly persecuted and then give another 50% to the commandant at the camp and the decision-making he had to make? Of course you wouldn't. So why people expect journalists to be impartial in very hostile situations, especially in hostile situations, then, you know, it, it, it is difficult. However, when it comes to reporting events, um, unfolding political events, then I think that uh, that is where there is more of a care and a duty to be impartial. So, um, so yeah. Are you yeah, saying that there are some instances in which a journalist should be partial and there are some situations in which journalists should be impartial? Well, we're all driven by appetite and it's, you know, what does the reader or the viewer want? During the Donald Trump years, for instance, I was glued to CNN because although they were perceived to be an enemy of Trump, I knew that I would get sure. a news agenda that was quite different to the lick spittle toady coverage that we got from the Fox News Channel, which, you know, thought that Trump could walk on water. I didn't want to listen to propaganda. Most people don't. Um, but I, I did enjoy the CNN reports because they were revealing, uh, very frank, and of course, quite damaging. Uh, towards yeah. Trump. Maybe you are anti-Trump and that's why you decided to glue yourself uh, to CNN because like nothing good came out of CNN about Trump. He also well, said I it. wasn't. I wasn't alone because I think that they ended up with record viewing figures during the Trump era. Maybe Gina can tell us about that. But it's it, true. It's they a... actually made their first billion dollar profit that first year. I think it was 2018 on the heels of their coverage of the election 2016 and 2017. So you're absolutely right. That proved to be not only a watchdog style that there was with their ideology, but also it, it proved to get a lot of viewers. And then, of course, through that advertisers and revenue. So you're absolutely right. I think it, it's important. I don't want to step over what you were the point you were making, though, Yvonne. Sorry. Uh, no, no, it's it's uh, it's fine. I just think you know, news yeah. and media are very much guided by the appetite of their readers and their viewers, and people wanted to know about the dirt dug up on Trump, and CNN had the longest spade to be able to do that, and they did it without fear or favor, which was. Really, um, it, it probably flew in the face of what uh, trainee journalists are taught, but it was absolutely riveting and engaging. And as you say, it was a commercial success. And I yeah. think, yes, and I think there were a couple other takeaways from that as well on that can that ran in parallel. If I can, I'm a much better writer than I am articulator sometimes in real 
the <laughs> the, the, yeah, public the, opinion, the opinion and personalities that were made through CNN and others in in particular opposing Trump that became its own sort of sport to watch then there was also that simultaneous straight documentary documenting of the facts against him in terms of did he do this was there a payoff money to a to a prostitute was there this was those are some facts right not alternative facts like kelly conway said his press his one of his spokespeople at the time so then there were that then there were those that other outlets also reported then over in the Fox line, there were also personalities who were building themselves and their viewership around the pro-Trump side. Now, here's what's interesting, which we know has just come out really to light in the last couple of weeks on the heels of this defamation lawsuit from Dominion Electoral Voting Machines of over a billion dollars aimed at the Fox News organization. And as the testimony and the evidence is coming out in this case... There has been demonstrated, and Rupert Murdoch, the owner of Fox, has, has testimony that says, yes, these in particular three of their very well-known, very highly paid anchors on the Fox station were knowingly espousing lies mm. about the grand steal and the fraudulent election and the stolen election in public to the audience to keep those audience and those commercialization and advertising numbers with them at the same time privately because the private chats have come out through whatsapp they were saying how they thought it was lies and people were insane they'd have a they didn't believe as sean hannity said didn't believe it for two seconds what one of the attorneys for trump Sidney powell was saying so that's really frightening not an agenda of an angle or a little bit of massaging of of our viewpoint, but out and out, we don't believe it, but yet we're going to espouse it. And you don't see that, or you haven't at least evidence based seen that from a CNN. And what I don't yeah. like is when organize when people go, oh, well, they're both fake news. No, one is much faker than the other. <laughs> so the other. Anything going to happen from it? I don't know. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of things that can happen, happen simultaneously. You can have events by the numbers, and you can also have personalities. But out-and-out, bold-faced lying, that's a, something else entirely. So so there's, there's a little bit of problem and mistrust in the American media space. Um, how, how possible? Let me, know, let me rephrase the question. Um, how we, the outsiders, the people that are not living in America, especially in Africa, uh, we, a lot of us want to uh, tune to CNN or Fox News in order to watch what is going on in America. But then, like with all these conversations that Fox is leaning to Republican and probably CNN and MSNBC leaning to Republican, I mean, Democrat, Democratic Party, how, what, how should we be convinced that the news, the content that we're consuming from those media organizations are simply good and legitimate and credible. Well, real quickly, and I want to hand it over to Yvonne, a lean isn't the same as a lie. So a little bit of watchdoggery on the, what, on the left uh, when it comes to the Republicans. I will say that having worked with CNN during the Bush administration and then the, the Clinton administration, we were certainly telling the stories about the, the Kenneth Starr report and the investigation on Monica Lewinsky and, and Whitewater and many other things that were happening. We weren't just saying, oh, yeah, Clinton forever is a, is a terrific guy. We were also reporting on what he did with the Good Friday Peace Accords that, and the troubles between the North Northern Irish and, and the Republic of Ireland, where I live, too. So there's a combination of that. But to your point, and then I want to go over to Yvonne, there are other news outlets there are, there are, there's The Guardian, there's The Economist, there's BBC, there's Sky, there's other English language news journalists that are out there that are reporting news. And I think it's important for people, especially from countries where there might be emerging press that could be being government control and things like that, to try to get as much of a variety of food that you can when it comes to feeding yourself with news. Okay, Dr. Yvonne. Well, what can you say about the objectivity in, in the American media in general? 
Well, if there's a subject that I'm particularly interested in, I don't go to one new source. You learn to find who is providing the best information and you try and, and get a sample from three or four different uh, agencies on news outlets. And then by listening to all of it, you can start to get around a picture of actually what is going on. In fact, it's a bit unfair, but I would uh, say to your listeners, uh, Omar, is that uh, people have got to shop around and uh, get the new source that they're most comfortable with. I mean, there's one thing um, giving out information about Trump that he doesn't want to get out to the new news people. But then there's something quite sinister peddling deliberate lies about Trump. And unfortunately, he was such a maverick character it was almost impossible to find out what was true and what was a lie. Yeah, of course. So so briefly, Dr. Yvonne, um, with reference to the British media um, organizations, what, what can you say about the level of objectivity there? Because uh, recently the BBC released a documentary called The Modi Question, uh, which uh, talks about uh, a massacre that happened in 2002 in the state of Gujarat when the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi was the then governor of that state. Um, some, ev some, some evidence suggested that um, he was behind the massacre of the, those people, majority of whom were Muslims, more than a thousand uh, or so. Uh, then now the Indian government said that the BBC was trying to, uh, to play colonial master on them so that they were trying to like uh, impose on them the colonial administration stuff uh, on them. And, and all the Indian media organizations were very much criticizing and lambasting not only the BBC, but the whole UK thing. Uh, now, do you think, and do you see the level uh, objectivity in the media industry uh, in the UK there? The BBC used to be regarded as the gold standard of journalism. And sadly, that has slipped away now. It has lost its reputation. But having said that, that documentary on Gujarat, we do know that there was a massacre in Gujarat. We do know that Modi was the governor in Gujarat at that time. And therefore, this massacre happened on his watch. That's what you could say at best. At worst, the BBC was suggesting that he was the architect of the massacre. And if my memory serves me right, the British government did uh, refuse a visa to Modi when he was coming to visit Britain as a politician, it was before he was leader and therefore leaders are deemed exempt from such um, restrictions. And uh, so, you know, there was a degree of truth in that uh, documentary. However, the Indian media is quite disgraceful at times in its uh, the levels and quality of its reporting. We had, for instance, uh, the reporting that has come out of India on Afghanistan has been nothing short of shocking. Within days of the Taliban takeover, a helicopter was deployed to remove certain flags from high structures and this was done by a man on a winch who removed the flags. That picture was taken and put out by the Indian media saying the Taliban have started hanging people already. Look what they're doing to this guy. And the image 
with that caption looked quite shocking until you realized the real story behind the image. And they they also used a photograph of a downtrodden woman walking about 10 paces behind a man in um, Afghanistan with, and the three women in the photograph had shackles on their feet. And this was a writer's picture that had been photoshopped. And it was the original photograph was taken in Raqqa in Iraq, Syria, um, under ISIS. But it was just put out there and portrayed as the Taliban have started their own. And, and so, you know, there was this, black propaganda going out and most of that emanated from the Indian press. Okay, so uh, Gina, uh, what can you add upon this? Like the, the whole coverage, because we're going to talk about a little bit about um, the way the media is portraying the Taliban government uh, with, with Yvonne, I'm sure she will, she will, she will have a lot to say, but do you have any experience, Gina, with regards to how the Indian media works? I'm not privy. No, is the short answer. I I don't have direct contact to our experience with the with the Indian media per se. But having lived in Egypt, hmm. having lived in Romania, having worked in a lot of emerging democracies, uh, certainly the time that I've spent in Nigeria, there are hmm. levels of journalism and journalistic integrity. So there's a difference between making an honest mistake and as we were talking about when the Fox discussion earlier, making bold faced decisions that have no merit in fact at all and trying to find out what that motivation was. Was it a mistake? Was there a retraction? Is it an ongoing loose, weak, non-structured form of journalism? Is it controlled? by an owner, which is connected to a party. All that kind of stuff is hard for people who study journalism to unpack, let alone your average pick, picker-upper of a newspaper or turner-owner of a television channel or listener to a podcast or wherever you're getting your media food these days, who's busy, who doesn't have time to read a lot of different sources, who's maybe finding news on Facebook and these kinds of things. That's the problem is that we have lots of, we have as as Yvonne was saying, we have gold standards, we hope, but then there's everything in between. And how do you discern that? And I don't have an answer for that, but I certainly do have an empathy for people who are quick to say, and probably with a lot of good reason based on their experience, that I don't trust the media. And it doesn't help when easy catchphrases like fake news begin to dominate our parlance. So you can easily just dismiss something that you don't like as fake news. And that's part of where we, we almost have a false narrative going on right now because we don't have time to unpack it into those categories that you are so kindly giving us an opportunity to try to explore. I do hope that more conversation around this will lead to more understanding, which will help us make more informed choices. But that's the be only beginning of a long walk, I'm afraid. Yeah, yeah, definitely, of course. Um, Yvonne, what can you say about the um, Western media's coverage of the Taliban? Do you still, um, are you still with your opinion that it's one-sided and not fair? Very much so. Um, unfortunately, the Taliban themselves are not media savvy. They could do with advice from Gina, that's for sure on how to project themselves and how to um, work with the media. But a lot of uh, nonsense has been written about them, which is simply not true. And this is in order to demonize them, which let's face it, they're doing a good enough job themselves with this ridiculous ban on girls attending school and girls being told that uh, they can't go to university. 
but the the media has descended on Afghanistan and is going to the clinics where children are dying of starvation, they're dying of lack of food, they're dying of lack of medicine, they're dying uh, because they're getting diseases that the doctors aren't capable of uh, remedying. And all of this is happening because America has, through Biden, frozen all the accounts and the banks in Afghanistan. Now, I was there in April and it was astonishing. I... I... You went to Afghanistan or the US? No, I went to Afghanistan in, um, in April. And I went, I couldn't use the cash machines. You you can't, uh, you know, the hole in the wall machines with their credit cards, they wouldn't work. Um, not to be outdone, I went back to my hotel room and went on to the internet to buy something from Amazon. I couldn't do that. I couldn't make the simplest transactions. There is no money. It's all been frozen. And of but, course... But you, it, you shouldn't blame the US. You should blame the Afghan government, the Taliban government, for not providing to the people there. Well, it's not the responsibility that, of the US government to provide social amenities to the people of Afghanistan right now, since the occupying the, forces The Biden left. administration has frozen all the, the economy. People cannot spend. People cannot buy medicines. Uh, no businesses around the world are allowed to trade with Afghanistan. So even, you know, any businessman from a, somebody who runs a corner shop to a, a big um, enterprise, if you can't pay your staff, if you can't buy produce, you can't function. So the country is limping along because all of its assets have been frozen. Okay. Furthermore, um, I think three and a half billion uh, dollars worth of currency have been removed that uh, belongs to the Afghan people. And that has been set aside to give compensation to the survivors and families of those who perished in 9-11. Now, when I was there in Kabul, uh, some of the families of 9-11 and representatives held a press conference and they said, Mr. Biden, this is wrong. This should not be happening. Uh, we want compensation, but not from the Afghan people. This is not their fault. Um, you know, there were 19 Arab hijackers. This is, uh, and, and it was an astonishing and moving press conference. But try and find it in the Western media and you won't, because they didn't want to report the truth. And so so they, are, they are hiding in, the truth? Yes. Yes. The and Taliban the cannot... Media, you for all of them. The Taliban cannot function normally because of the US sanctions. And so they're being set up to fail. And it, okay. it's... Uh, yeah. It yeah. is... Uh, you know, Afghanistan, it's a landlocked country. It's in the middle of the Silk Road route. China wants to open up that trade route. And everybody along that trade route will prosper, including Afghanistan and their neighbor, Pakistan. Um, but none of that is going to happen at the moment because of sanctions. And this is, is not being reported uh, truthfully. And it's a bit like the reports <laughs> at the moment that are coming out of Ukraine. 
we're not being told the truth there either. You know, when the the war in Ukraine started, and I'm by no means a Putin supporter, what he did was vile and loathsome. He had no business going into Ukraine. But what uh, the the images that we saw coming out of Ukraine were grandmothers filling uh, bottles full of uh, fuel to make um, Molotov cocktails. And there were very feel-good factor stories around saying, you know, Lithuanian um, uh, Ukrainian grannies are going to take on the Red Army and look at them, you know, with their their Molotov cocktails. And, the, and that was just to make people think that uh, Ukraine really needs an army, it needs weapons. Ukraine already had an army, a sophisticated army with sophisticated weapons. It didn't need grannies with Molotov cocktails fighting mm. the Russians, but this was good war, uh, feel-good propaganda that we were fed. Every yeah. day we're told yeah. that Putin is dying, that he's got some incurable disease, that he's going to keel over, that his men are going to kill him. Well, he's lasted more than a year, and the last image I saw of him, he looked in extremely rude health indeed. <laughs> then we're yeah. told that uh, yeah. the the Russians are losing. Well, when you look at the aerial maps, they're still holding on to a huge swathe, about 25% of, of uh, Ukrainian territory. That isn't losing, that's digging in. And I just feel as though we need to be told the truth about what is going on. I mean, I'm feeling quite jittery because I'm, you know, the generation after the Second World War. And uh, and I'm very concerned about the prospect yeah. of a war yeah. in Europe and why we are giving all these sophisticated weapons and fighter jets and tanks to the Ukrainians. I'm not sure, because surely it would be better if the international community got round the table and tried to talk instead of fueling a war, a never-ending war, a war which yeah. is now so entrenched, we're going to be looking at it for the next 10 years at least. Yeah, that's very bad. Let me bring in Gina London. Two things, uh, I, I can see that we're running out of time. You, you have another meeting in the next uh, three or five minutes. Uh, Gina, what can you say about both the issues, the portrayal of Taliban by the Western media or on the Western media, and then the issue of uh, Ukraine war? We're not being told the truth uh, about what is going on there. Well, I think it brings us back to the very beginning of this conversation, which is a couple of things around the objectivity and then the angle and the truth as there is in the con context and the facts that there are so far. And a couple of things around the Taliban and another concept we haven't really touched on, but I want to bring into layer on is the idea of oversimplification, especially in television news, especially when the most complex story that I had, I could have a minute 30 to tell it in. And I was one of a number of other people on the site and hopefully they also had some other uh, angles that they could tell. And And I can't comment fully on this, the sanctions from a policy standpoint for the United States against the Taliban, other than to say that the stated policy is that economic sanctions are the way that the government puts pressure on what they see as a delegitimate, an illegitimate government in order to force change. And Yvonne mentioned that there's no f women's rights in the Taliban, certainly because it comes to school and education. And is the economic sanctions too much? Is it getting the desired effect? We know oftentimes, unfortunately, what happens in economic sanctions is the people suffer and the regime stay the same. And that's not just in Afghanistan, but other countries as well. And taking those policies aside, Hopefully, again, back to I think one of our main themes that we shared, I think, today is the responsibility of 
consumers of news to find a variety of sources. There's going to be that simple, oversimplified granny's making Molotov cocktail story for a minute 30. There's also going to be a deeper dive unpacked magazine story, hopefully in a niche magazine like foreign policy or, or the, the, the online magazine that Yvonne writes for that's going to unpack it from a more foreign policy strategic point of view. And that takes time, it takes effort, but that is, I think, the way to get more comprehensive and more balanced understanding in the midst of so much news coming at us from so many different platforms all the time, 24 hours a day. Yeah, so mm -hmm. Gina, do you, uh, do you think that the coverage of the Ukraine war is one-sided by the Western media all, all the time, whenever you watch in the BBC, CNN and other Western media organizations, you will see that Putin is being labeled as an aggressor and that he's always losing and the Ukrainians are always being um, uh, more, how can I say, defensive. They're always defending themselves and they're very, very, very courageous. They're courageously defending themselves and they're trying to push back the Russian uh, forces. Is that it is, refer to my previous comment in the amount of time let me say this it is an indisputed fact that russian army invaded unprovoked a sovereign nation that doesn't equate with what's happening in yemen or what's happening in other countries where that type of thing goes on and the level of coverage is happening versus a european situation like that in other situations i think that's worth a deeper discussion but in terms of the actual fact itself and then you put the layers of words and empathy and how much coverage is on those are things to to be aware of but i refer to my previous comment about the and as yvonne said we're, there's audiences there's appetites there's money-making entities and journalism by nature oversimplifies and does have to make a bottom dollar well, fine. We, we run out of time. Of course, Gina has got another call to make uh, in the next two minutes. So thank you very much indeed. Finally, Gina, what can you say about the show? Oh, well, I'm delighted. I think what you do, Yumar, to bring people from different points of view, different experiences together. I love your connect, your commitment to connection. I love your commitment to conversation. I'm grateful for this opportunity. And Yvonne, it was lovely to be with you and you as well, Yumar. Yeah, Yvonne, Dr. Yvonne, what can you finally say about this? Mm -hmm. Absolutely agree. You're doing a fantastic job um, in the pursuit of good journalism and telling people, you know, that there is a difference between propaganda, lies and uh, spin. And it's up to them to work out which is which. All right. well done. thank you yeah yeah of course <clears throat> so i'm so happy to have um to have had you on the show uh, with me talking about this issue of objectivity even though we've not touched at least 50 percent of the issue that there's a lot of things that we should talk about uh, but i hope i hope uh, in the near future i'll be able to uh, to have you again uh, in order to pick up from where we uh, have left off thank you very much indeed okay thank you okay so on behalf of everyone that has contributed, and I'm saying Umar Isad and Dugo is saying goodbye, and see you very soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Uh, so thank you very much, Gina, for the...